Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Director of Product Development, Raymond Massey of Pearl. Raymond, welcome to the show. Hey, Bart. Thanks a lot. Great to be here. Man, Pearl drums are just... You can't think of drums without thinking of Pearl. You guys definitely have a, uh, a huge role in, in, the, in the history of drums and the market and all that stuff. So I'm excited to learn about the history. Um, why don't you just take us back to the beginning of Pearl? Okay. I'll tell you what I know. I'm, I'm not the definitive expert, but um, I'm happy to share. Sure. You know, um, basically Pearl was founded on April 2nd, 1946. That's my birthday, April 2nd. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> our, our founder was Katsumi Yanagasawa. It started out, uh, you know, at the end of World War II, you know, Japan was in the throes of being rebuilt. And uh, Katsumi-san used to make music stands. So the very first products were music stands out of his small shop in uh, the Chiba, Japan, just outside of Tokyo. Hmm. Boy, that's fascinating. So post-World War II, I, I imagine that uh, it's so interesting because on the show, we talked a lot about um, European drum ba- brands with, with post-World War II and, uh, you know, the R- Slingerland and the Rolling Bombers and stuff, but you don't really, you don't hear much about the Japanese brands. So that's fascinating. Yeah, so he was making music stands, and you know, during that time, I would say the late forties, uh, early fifties, uh, Western jazz was becoming popular, and uh, in Japan, and there just wasn't a lot of drums. You know, the servicemen, USA servicemen, were coming to Japan, and they wanted music, and people were hungry for music, and uh, the school system adopted Western style music classes and and uh they needed drums so kasumi san started making drums hmm. after music stands and you know if you think about it drum set 90 percent of a drum set is hardware yeah so if you've got metal chops you know making a round cylinder out of wood and of course there's integrity and pride in that but um it's it's Make the metal part of it and having that under your belt a, a good leeway and good head start to making a drum set. Let me, man, I love this. This is just, I didn't know it went back that far. So what is, if, if you were going to find the like, the like crown jewel, you know, vintage, vintage pearl, how old would that be? Like how old is the earliest drum set that you know of? Like, I know you said fifties ish. Is that, are there drum sets from the 50s that are Pearl? Well, they are. But the thing is, they're not actually called Pearl. Mm. They were a lot of... See, when Pearl started, he's, Katsumi-san, he was, he was making these drum sets, but he was making them for a, a lot of different people. Retailers all over mm-hmm. the world that wanted to supply drums. And mm-hmm. they were brands like Westbury and... Uh, Sentinel, Scott, Crest, Apollo, yep. Baxter. Uh, and then later on came, of course, Maxwin and, and CB700 and yep. Lido and st- stuff like that. Okay. But the, probably the, the one kid, if you can find one, uh, and you see him from time to time out there, is the President Series. Yes, yeah. And the President Series, that was probably – you know, Pearl's finest introduction into the uh, drum manufacturing time. You know, it featured phenolic shells, which are sought after, actually. People love that sound. You know, phenolic is a, a, a plastic style resin paper. Uh, and, you know, the kits consisted of, you know, 22, 14, 13, 9, 16, 16, and snare drum. Wow, that's so cool. I think so Pearl obviously is is a part of the uh the O we well, we'll call it the OEM, the stencil, the um MIJ, the made in Japan world, um, which 
I, I have a, an old MIJ kit. Um, that is such a neat piece of history in itself. And I did an episode on that so people can listen to that. But um, it's it's very cool. And, and obviously, though, it's pretty clear that they, like Tama, they went the way of, okay, we're going to make drums for other people. And then they said, okay, we've got something here. Let's make our own drums and put our own name on it. Do, do you know where the name Pearl where did Pearl come from? Ah, uh, that's an interesting story. Um, you know, uh, Kasumi-san had a friend uh, that was helping him in the beginning when he was making music stands and making these drum sets. And uh, his friend owned a, a retail store in Japan, and he sold musical instruments and stuff. And, um, you know, at the time we were, you know, Pearl was making all these OEM kits and didn't have their own identity. And he thought about what can I call the company? Because, you know, I want something that resonates with the entire world. There's something that's beautiful and something that's held in high regard. And, uh, you know, he was proud to be a Japanese manufacturer and he wanted to make the best drums and musical instruments that he possibly could. So, his friend suggested the name Pearl and Katsumi san liked it. Hmm. And he thought about it. He's like, you know what? The, in Japan, you know, it's famous for pearls. Some of the best pearls in the world come from Japan. And it's, and it's also something that the entire planet, you know, holds in high regard. You know, pearls are, are, are yeah. beautiful. You know, people, uh, ladies like them, you know, it's the, it's the, <laughs> The whole thing, it's a wonderful piece of jewelry. So that's hmm. where the name came from. God, that's fascinating. It's it's kind of silly, but like I just I almost I don't know if I've ever equated the name Pearl in the drum company, and it seems so stupid now, but to an actual pearl from like an oyster. I mean it's it's uh you think of it as synonymous just with this is the name of the drum company. So sometimes your brain doesn't like put it together that like, oh yeah, duh, it's named after the beautiful pearl because it's you know sought after and everyone likes it um that's cool that's fascinating so um all right so started in the late 40s then they're making oem drums for people basically through the 50s correct yes. and then when would you say so in the 60s is that when they started it, it, to become pearl you're exactly right all right so then what happens then i'm sure ringo had a big uh you know that like everyone that probably helped uh <laughs> <laughs> make things uh, the world of drummers you know blew up so i'm sure that helped their their business a little bit oh yeah yeah i mean the demand for drums at that time was was very heavy and uh pearl you know company was growing under the direction of uh katsumi san and his son mitsuo yanagasawa uh was going to college chiba technical college uh, and studying to be an engineer. So he started helping out his dad, you know, through school. He's helping out his dad, then finally came in as a full time employee and knew that, you know, we need to do something to meet this kind of demand. So he wanted to put a plan together uh, for a big factory in Taiwan, you know, because they had the small factory. Uh, in Japan, they were making drums, and that's where our office still is. When we go over for corporate meetings, the uh, the the old factory's right behind the office building. So Masuo-san knew that in order to supply and meet the demand of the world, they would need a large factory. They would need automation. Uh, so he was one of the first uh, manufacturers to go to Taiwan. You know, at that time, yeah. it was it made a lot of sense from, you know, a manufacturing standpoint. And they built a forty three thousand square foot factory, you know, and yeah. they and they started making all kinds of drums out of that factory, percussion instruments and and and, uh, you know, symphonic stuff and 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 even timpani. Wow. So so Mitsuo. Uh, and he was working for the company when I started still, when we would go over to corporate meetings, he was still the chairman. And, uh, you know, he had vision. He knew that 
to meet that demand, we need to automate. Because at the time, the drums that were being made in Japan were almost handmade. They were made out of uh, some equipment that uh, Katsumi some purchased and uh, some he had made. But this was the big, you know, I would say in 1961, um, that's when it really started taking off. Yeah, interesting. And then a couple of years later, I'm sure it took off even more with, uh, like we said, just the world of drums blowing up. Um, okay, gosh, you know, Taiwan has such a, um, I'm sure it's manufacturing of all kinds, but uh, with, with drum making, it's such a, uh, it's such an integral part. And I didn't know it went back that far. I thought it was more of a modern thing where it's like, you know, chipping or, or where manufacturing goes back there. Is there a simple answer to why Taiwan is so good for manufacturing effectively and affordably? Well, you know, it's always been affordable. Yeah. And in the very beginning, you know, um, the workers, they had, they had to be taught, you know, the mm -hmm. products coming out of Taiwan, in my opinion, today rival anybody's. Some of Agreed. the best, some of the best drum sets in the world come out of Taiwan. Ours do, our most yeah. high end, and we we think they're the best drum sets in the world. We believe that they yeah. are, and it it in the beginning, you know, of course, it's like any manufacturer. There's they weren't really making musical instruments in Taiwan. It was cost effective, a good place to set up factories. So he did have vision in that regard because prior to that, think about it, things were being made in Japan you know, in, in America, but, you know, standard of living was, was going up in Japan and it was, you know, regulations. So it was, it was a bit tougher to manufacture in Japan and be cost effective, you know, on the, in, within the world market. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, that's interesting. All right. So we're in the sixties. Um, any other things in the '60s, or do we just kind of roll into the uh, into the '70s? I mean, I guess Pearl is building itself uh, a name as a as a name. I, I know that a lot of uh, towards the end of the '60s and into the '70s, I know a lot of uh, American drum companies were were really starting to worry and take notice and say, "Oh, geez, these these uh, you know companies from the Far East are, are giving us a run for our money, and people are liking them because they're they're great drums." You're exactly right. And Pearl always took pride in creating a tremendous value and quality in their drum sets. And that's what made Export so successful. I mean, we've sold well over a million Export drum sets. And if you think about it, when Export was introduced in, in 1982, uh, it, it changed what a uh, entry-level drum set should be. Yeah, I want to, let's do the 70s, but I think the export, we can stop there for a little bit and talk a lot about that, because that's just, I mean, I feel like you could, in a crowd of people, not even a crowd of drummers, you could like just say, hey, who here has owned a Pearl Export set? And at least like one person in any room will raise their hand and be like, yeah, I had one growing up. Um, but all right, so the 70s, um, I love the catalogs and stuff too. There's some really neat catalogs and, and, and beautiful drums. Yeah, in the 70s, they just started breaking in the United States. And probably, I think what really, I mean, drummers knew about it. Uh, guys like Art Blakey and, and J.C. Hurd and stuff like that. Those guys, American artists that were going to Japan, especially jazz guys that were playing, because jazz is always was popular in Japan. You know, every everybody in Japan knew Pearl. So these guys were getting to know Pearl. Pearl was asking these artists for their opinions about products. And that's one thing we've always done. We've always asked artists, you know, what do you think of this? How can we make a drum set better? And then we listen. Then our engineers take notes and they change the products. But in the 70s, the break in the U.S., you know, KISS was a mm -hmm. big, big part of that around the early 70s with Peter Chris, you know, and even on the back of their records, they always had, you know, uh, Kiss, you know, plays Pearl drums exclusively because they want the best. Yeah. That was on the, on the back. And a lot of kids read that 
And at the time, you know, we were having trouble finding uh, distribution in the U.S. There was a, a company called Chicago Musical Instrument Company, CMI, that uh, was a, a probably the largest distributor of musical instruments in the U.S. at the time. And there was a division of that company uh, called LD Heater Music. And uh, Heater Music took on Pearl and started making headway in the West Coast. And the guys at uh, Pro Drum in Hollywood were very instrumental in getting, uh, you know, guys in the 70s to switch and play Pearl. You know, that guys would come in Pro Drum and, and looking at gear and they would say, hey, you know, this is a new company. You should check out their drums. And uh, slowly, people started switching and playing Pearl. Mm. And throughout the 70s, uh, LD Heater Music Company was eventually absorbed by Norlin Music. And Norlin at the time was owned by Gibson Guitars, uh, you know, they, I mean, they own Lowry Organs, Gibson Guitar Distribution, uh, and they really started putting Pearl out there in the U.S. Heck, I remember seeing the first uh, acrylic Pearl drum set when I was a kid in 1973 at a music store in, in Newport News, Virginia, wondering. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen it before, and it was a red acrylic kit, and I was like, "Who? what is this company? You know, and then I, I saw a Kiss album and put two and two together. You know, wow, the power of being like an impressionable young kid and seeing that logo and just like it, it's like mesmerizing. Like, there's it's just so funny. It has nothing to do with the sound, it has nothing to do with, I mean, it does, but like you just see it and you connect with it. And that's that's a powerful thing. Can we pause? I just want to ask, all right, so two questions the shell construction i know earlier on it was like a lot of those kind of mij the the oem stuff were like kind of a, a a luan right like a um like a thinner wood what type of wood would they typically be made well of? in the very beginning they were i mean we used luan like everybody which is a uh basically asian mahogany it's a mm -hmm. it's a porous wood it's soft you know it's in believe it or not it sounds really good it does with the, with the right heads, and yeah. it, as long as the shell's constructed well, with that, it's if it's round and flat and has a good edge on it, uh, they sound wonderful. In fact, uh, the late Tommy Wells, a Nashville drummer here that uh, did lots of recordings, uh, he would swear by in the eighties when I start when I started at Pearl and stuff. He would come into the office all the time, and he would go, "Man, these exports." They're the bomb. I use them on sessions all the time, hmm. you know? Wow. But yeah, Luan, but we also had our Phenalic. Uh, we had fiberglass drums. Yeah. So at that time, you know, if you think about it, especially when you look at some of the American drum companies, Maple really hadn't come into play yet. Sure. You know, a lot of guys were using Poplar, Mahogany, you know, different shell blends. Uh, but the maple thing didn't really happen until I think people really wanted beautiful finishes on the outside of drums, lacquer yeah. finishes. And that era of, um, you know, the 70s and the 60s, I guess, had such cool finishes. I mean, there are just uh, that was my favorite looking back through catalogs. That was just my favorite um I guess you could say period of these just far out finishes. And I, I posted something on um, the drum history Instagram of, of uh, it was a Pearl uh, drum catalog from 1968. And there was um, tiger's eye and sparkling gold Pearl and sunset and light blue <laughs> Pearl. And, and I said, yeah, what do people like, yeah. like the most? And it was kind of a, uh, it's just funny. Cause I said, Hey, what do you guys like? And I got a ton of answers of people saying, um, I, they people said I love the blue pearls. Everyone really likes the tiger's eye. Um, it's yeah. just very very neat. Um, so that's just that's a that's a part of history too. Is, is the drum finishes. Um, now another question, and then another one popped up too. But I also want to ask you: Is there any story behind the logo? It's a pretty simple script pearl. It sort of changed from the earlier era where it was kind of more. Um, it was less. Uh, 
um, stylized, but is there anything about the logo where that came from? Well, I'm not really sure where the one that, you know, in the sixties, a lot of people affectionately refer to it as the pig logo hmm. because it, because the way the, the pearl is written and it's, it's got these arches above and below the, the word pearl and the L looks like a little tail. It looks like, and it looks like a little animal. So that's, that's funny. Yeah, it is kind of funny, but the, the newer version, um, in our tagline, you know, the best reason to play drums came from Terry West, who is, uh, actually our current CEO in the United States, but he started out here as the, uh, ad director and, uh, you know, was responsible for all the ads and the, and the marketing and, and the basically shaping the modern Pearl, you know, him, he, and, uh, together with, uh, Mr. Takasomi, uh, and, uh, you know, Mitsuo and, uh, our current chairman, uh, Mazakatsu Yanagasawa. Hmm. So is it, has it always been, in the same family, yes. As far as it is, wow. That's that's the funny thing, you know. A lot of people, you know, we talk to over the years, don't realize that Pearl is a family business. It's not some public company with investors. It's it's a private family owned business by Diana Gasalas, and right now, uh, our current chairman, who you know. Is Matsuo's son and the and the grandson of our founder, uh, Katsumi son, is uh, Masakatsu, and he's still mm-hmm. very active, and and still you know the driving force behind you know our company. You know we take pride. We want to make the best drums in the world, best sounding drums, best quality. You know for a fair price. Hmm. Gosh, that's that has happened. Uh... I think most recently I, I, I did an interview with um, someone from Vic Firth and I was like, you guys are mega. You're huge. You're massive. You're a big company. And he was like, well, actually there's like six of us who work here. <laughs> <I'm> just <laughs> like, uh, I mean, obviously there's a bunch of people at Pearl, but there's you, you you're right. You think it's like this big public company, but uh, it's a family company. That's so cool to, um, to know that. I, I think that marketing has a lot to do with people just kind of thinking that that a company is 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 massive and mega, which you guys obviously are a very big company, but um, it's still got that that family tie, which is so cool. Um, my yeah. last interjecting question that we can carry on is: you said the 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 fiberglass. Um, so I have uh, where I work, Gwyn Sound. There's a wood fiberglass kit there that um someone. I've mentioned this on the show before. Someone before my time bought a bunch of like studio essential drums, like a Dynasonic, a Superphonic, um, Sabian studio hats, uh, regular hats, perfect, just very essential items. And he bought a uh, wood, a pearl wood fiberglass kit, bunch of toms, 16 and an 18 inch floor, which the 18 inch floor is just a beast. Um, when did those come into play? Because those those are pretty pretty popular too. And, and, uh, how does that construction work with mixing the wood and the fiberglass? Well, they came into play around the same time as mid, mid to late sixties. Uh, and the fiberglass, you know, it really adds a lot of high end and pop. I mean, even I think Neil Pert used to talk about that. There was a guy up in Fort Wayne that they called it Vibrify and Mm. uh, some of those earlier kids he did, but you know, fiberglass adds a certain amount of brightness and and, and shell rigidity. You know, to the sure. uh, so it's they're louder drums. Uh, but we even had all fiberglass back in the day, and a lot of people don't even know that this that uh, even Steve Gadd, some of his when he started out his career, a lot of the toms you heard were pearl. People hmm. like those fiber single headed fiberglass toms. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. Kind of a style, um, especially the single-headed stuff. That's uh, those are coming back though. You see a lot of the concert toms now with people um, making a resurgence. But uh, yeah, uh, 
All right, so back into the history here. I think we were in the 70s. Any other things of note there before we hop into the 80s, which I'm assuming I kind of think of Pearl as just something must have switched in the 80s where I guess Kiss had a lot to do with it, but it just, there's a lot of, you know, heavy metal drummers who played Pearl. Yeah, I mean, when we basically, in the in 1979, we separated uh, from Norlin and Gibson. And uh, at the time, Masuo-san decided that it's it's time we control our destiny. So he set he bought property here in Nashville, and uh, we also had different distribution centers. We had one in Texas, one in California, one in New York. We were kind of spread out with smaller, all uh, owned by Pearl Japan, wholly owned. Uh, all across the United States. And then eventually we consolidated all of those into the Nashville office here on Metroplex drive. Um, and in the early eighties around, I think around 1983, uh, he opened up another, uh, Pearl Japan owned distribution center in Milton Keynes in the UK, hmm. you know, and, and you got to remember too, even, during that time, we had about 70 different distributors all over the world. So in the 80s, what Pearl looked like, I mean, you had Pearl Japan, you had Pearl Taiwan, you had uh, a small factory uh, in China, you had Pearl, you know, Europe come into play in, in the 2000s. Um, just a good breach all over the world. So to get back to your question, yeah, in the eighties, things really started to take off and Pearl started making more and more high end drums. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had the export of course in, in 82, but in the mid eighties, you had the GLX, you know, that featured the, uh, uh, super gripper lugs. There was a lot of innovation. They had electronic drums, the fight man, Pearl symbols, but MLX, that was key in the eighties because that was probably, and still to this day, my, one of my favorite Pearl shells, it's the six ply 100% maple shell that's 7.5 millimeters thick. And mm -hmm. the M old MLX drums had the long lugs and you're right. I mean, kiss was happening. You had Bercaro, you know, all these guys, just people really putting Pearl on the map. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm looking on Vintage Drum Guide too, kind of while we're talking at some catalogs. There's looking at one from 1978. It looks a lot different from the catalog from 1980, where just the first one you see, it's just it's bigger toms. The hardware oh, looks thicker. It looks more yeah. heavy duty. There's you know, there's four floor toms and they're huge yeah. and. There's one here um, that I think is worth mentioning of um, the Roto Rock, which appears to have like kind of a Roto Tom looking uh, thing above a drum shell. I've never seen really anything else like this. That's. Uh, do you have any <laughs> knowledge of that? Of that? Yeah, I remember seeing those, uh, especially when I was a kid. You know, because the Roto Tom was relatively a new thing from from remo yeah and uh there was a gentleman by the name of uh randy may who came up with that system mm. and that was his system and basically we just distributed it but it was a way to you know people like the sound of roto toms and of course if you turn them you could tune them pretty easy as yeah. well but just to get a little more projection mm. i remember those yeah yeah for people to visualize it it's basically a drum shell like a regular five-piece kit but there's no top head and there's a roto tom kind of connected above so it yeah. projects down into the drum um <laughs> that's such a you don't see stuff like that as much anymore i guess you do there, there are a lot of different things popping up but um yeah the electronics there's just all kinds of stuff in the 80s now the export it seems like it changed the landscape of like a beginner drum set, like you said. Like it, it defined what you're right because at that time, when when export there the if unless you wanted to buy a real professional drum set, there wasn't much else to choose from. 
You either mm-hmm. had to go big or you had to get some stuff that was, you know, okay, but it would, you know, break and, yeah. and just not be so, so great. And when export came out, it, it really defined what a, a kit could, could be. I mean, the hardware was super heavy duty. The drums sounded great. They tuned well. It was a tremendous value. For, how for did the they market. do that? How did they, how did they, I guess the answer is just, well, they know what they're doing and they create good stuff, but like, why would they, why would Pearl be the first one to realize and say, Hey, we can make a drum set. That's really nice. That's not like, how did they cut, co- cut the costs and save that money to make, to make that kind of thing? It seems like someone would have done it before, I guess, or maybe, maybe just no one did it. Nobody did it. Pearl did mm-hmm. it first. And that yeah. was Matsuo realizing that, you know, cost of wages and materials are higher in Japan. And then you had the U.S. companies uh, in cost of manufacturing in the U.S. is not cheap. And he had the vision that if he went to a place like Taiwan, he could make really good drums and make them affordable. We, we, yeah. Pearl was the first one to start that train to get everybody to move, you know, factories and different places. Well, it's it's neat too because um, I'm sure most people stuck with Pearl, but I think we all agree as drummers that the best thing about any piece of gear is something that gets people playing the drums and starting into drums because it cross industry, cross uh, cross uh, company. It just helps because then people are buying cymbals, they're yeah. taking lessons, they're they're doing all this. So um, it's good. Yeah. It's healthy. We want people to play. And there's nothing, you know, if, you, if you're if you learning on an instrument, and I, I've personally taught lessons before, I try to tell students, and I think it's a good idea that if you're going to learn on something, learn on something good that's playable. Because if yeah. it's not, and it doesn't sound good, it's not playable, it's a negative. It's going to be a turnoff, you know? So, yeah. And, yeah. And, and our vision has always been to make great products. And during the 80s in that time, you know, a lot of people don't know that, uh, we also, they were going, we, we were making microphones, guitar amps, uh, guitar effects. It was, you know, electronic drums. But eventually, we focused just on acoustic drums with a lot of innovation. I mean, the gripper lug was very innovative for the time, a qu- kind of a quick-release lug. Uh, the oversize lug, which was, uh, I don't know if you remember, there was... Uh, some drums that we made that had uh, like if it was a 12 inch Tom, you put a 13 inch hoop and head on it, you know? Yeah. And, and they sounded, I played one of those kits, uh, a gentleman uh, here in Nashville uh, named Tommy Winkler had one of those drum sets and he had a drum shop in the, in the early nineties here in Nashville that uh, he had one of those kits. It really sounded phenomenal. So it's kind of like a, uh, almost like when you see like a gong bass drum where it's like the head is bigger. What, like, what is it? What is the sound? Is it, is it a little bit more like, um, because is air escaping a little bit out from the, having the wider head and rim? And then like, how, what does it sound like? Yeah. It's just more of an open sound. If you could think of the difference between die cast and a triple flange, mm-hmm. it's just a lot more open than a triple flange hoop. Hmm. But it was kind of, you know, depending on how you're playing style, you had to be careful doing rim shots and stuff on on a kit like that because, you know, you could run the risk of uh, the stick hitting the shell. Yeah, and with, with kits like that, it's obviously super cool and it's great for innovation and people buying them. But if you are like a normal Joe Schmo and you're going to buy one, let's say, $1,000 drum set every 10 years you might not splurge and spend it on the kind of unique um not gimmicky that's not the word i'm looking for but that that like innovative one where they're releasing it for a few years you know what i mean you might buy the like uh master series or whatever it would be called um so (laughs) drummers are conservative and they and especially when it comes to you know spending your heart on cash you want something that you can take to a lot of different gigs uh, play a lot of different styles. Uh, you know, also I'd like to mention another thing in the 80s. Uh, Pearl 
introduced the uh, championship series. We got into the marching business. Cool. You know, because the drum corps international DCI groups and, and high schools are starting to, to get more serious about their halftime shows and band. And, and uh, we got involved in that activity and we make some of the best marching products out there. We make the yeah. best if you ask me. Yeah. God, I mean, that's one of those things that that is a massive, I'm sure a massive part of your guys business. Cause there's, there's so many schools and you see Pearl at a lot of them. I mean, and you see that big oh, logo. Yeah. That's, that's great. Cause then those people, Hey, maybe they have a drum set at home. I play Pearl at school. I'm going to go home and buy a Pearl drum set. That's whoever did that. It's gotta be a <laughs> gotten to that has, has to be a, uh, you know, feeling pretty good about spreading the business even more. But the eighties was, I mean, Pearl was really starting to come in to to their own because you had marching, you had WLX, you had innovations like Cable Hat. You even had our CZX series, which these big, thick, 10-ply, 12.5-millimeter shells, you know, with square-sized toms because, you know, 80s was metal was popular. Yep. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And the hardware. So maybe we, I know everyone loves hearing about like the hardware, hardware and snares are something that I, I, I think we, we can, uh, you know, pause on too, because, uh, later on, you know, the Pearl like eliminator is one of those pedals. That's sort of a, uh, a staple pedal. I, I think the eliminator, the 5,000 and the iron Cobra are like, you know, there's, there's a 90% yeah. chance you're going to see one of those on, on someone's drum set. Um, the Eliminator was, I mean, that pedal is still a great, great seller. It's a, it's, it's a great pedal because you yes. can interchange the camps, and it's got a very, another unique feature that it's, it was based on its predecessor, the Power Shifter, and the mm -hmm. Power Shifter had a three position heel plate that you could it could move the heel, you know, closer to the bass drum uh farther back and then farther back again and the way i like to think about that is it's it's as if you're holding a drumstick and it it does the same thing to that pedal that you would think of if you're holding a drumstick if you choke up more toward the middle you're going to get a, a, a kind of lighter more articulate feel and as you back and go toward the butt of the drumstick you get what power yeah and and then with the eliminator Oh my gosh, four different cams, you know, everything from just, you know, regular round cam to, you know, a very aggressive, uh, our red cam that kind of just drops off, you know, um, it's, it's, you can get any kind of feel you want out of that pedal. And that's what we wanted. We wanted, hmm. you know, as players styles change and the music or whatever style they're playing, we wanted to make a pedal that everybody could get what they needed out of. Yeah, that's extremely innovative. I've never, I've owned one, but I've never actually experimented with um, switching out the cams. And it, it seems really easy and, um, and, and just kind of fun where you can mess around with it. And it's neat because you don't need to buy another pedal. <laughs> you no, know, you, you don't. don't need to say, okay, this one's a little looser. This one's a little, uh, you know, that's. That's really cool. And, and the, um, even the, the like Tom mounts, like the Pearl, you know, the, I, I've heard countless people say, and it's almost funny that like, they'll be like, um, like the Pearl t mounts are very like sturdy and reliable. And these vintage guys will say, yeah, someone, um, like a, a like a Ludwig top hat and cane kit, someone drilled it out and put a Pearl mount on it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Which, you know, that's like sacrilegious, but, um, it's, it's funny because a lot of guys, they'll, these, these old, uh, drum sets will be modified to have Pearl hardware because it's just reliable and it works. Yeah. A lot of people during that time in the, in the eighties and nineties, and even to this day, yeah, they our hardware, you know, is the best in the industry. And we're one of the only companies, uh, that offer a lifetime warranty on our hardware and we mean it when we say it's like craftsman tools you buy it once you play it for life you know wow. we're gonna we're gonna stand behind it and you're right it's it's the tom arms you know especially with the unilock tilter we were the first ones to to come out with a uh 
it's not a ball joint. It's it's a brake system. You know, even though ball joints are basically gearless, uh, mm-hmm. but this was a very very good innovation that we came out with. Uh, introduced that for our cymbal tilters and our uh, tom arms. Yeah. So wait, if I didn't know that, so if you, how does that warranty work? I'm sure, you know, some people don't know about that. So if you have any piece of Pearl hardware and it breaks, then do you just like, how does that work? Well, it starts after a certain period of time. That lifetime warranty uh, start started June 15th, 2009. Okay. So, so prior to that, it's just a regular three to five year warranty on most most products. But um, in 2009, we introduced the lifetime warranty. So how does it work? If you buy a pedal and uh, something breaks on it or the tilter doesn't work in your stand or something happens like that, and as long as it's not abused and and, uh, just used under normal circumstance, we replace it. Hmm. Man, that's cool. You only do that if you trust your gear enough to the point of it's, you know, like you can stand behind it and say this isn't going to be uh, every 10th stand you sell is going to break. Obviously, it's reliable stuff and you 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 believe in it. So that's really cool. I'll let you in on a secret. The amount of warranty uh, replacement parts that we put out is unbelievably low. Hmm. It's It's a fraction of a percent. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, and that's why yeah. we do it because we stand behind it. We, you know, we've always followed, uh, you know, our current uh, chairman's Mazakatsu still believes and mandates that we make the best possible product we can. Hmm. Wow. It's awesome. That's, that's an, it's, 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 it's good to know that. Um, just if anyone does have a problem, now they hear this, they can say, oh, wow, I didn't know. And, and that's, that just makes it makes the company look good as well. Just to know you have that peace of mind. It's like you buy a car and you have the warranty. You just kind of feel you feel better as you're driving down the road. All right. So let's move into I believe we're in the 80s. Let's move into the 90s if there's nothing else uh, really to discuss in the 80s. So then into the 90s, what, what happened there? In the 90s, uh, probably the most notable uh of course, you know, our marching products were getting better, but we introduced the Master Series. Mm-hmm. You know, this was a, prior to that MLX and stuff, everybody was doing the the, the long lugs on drums. So the, the Master Series, when it came out, it had split lugs, uh, Super Hoop 2, which is our 2.3 millimeter uh, triple flange hoops. That was huge for us, and we offered masters in maple and birch, and uh, eventually got into different versions of maple mahogany and all mahogany, African mahogany. And also in the '90s, we came out with uh, Masterworks in 1999, and Masterworks is our flagship series. It's our top of the line series, uh, and it is probably I would hands down the most customizable drum set there is basically if you can dream it we'll build it you have your choice of woods choice of hardware all you know several different lugs three different styles of hoops custom paint job i mean we've had guys send in uh pieces of their car articles of clothing you know copy a drum set you know uh, i want my drum set to match this you know, but you can change your barren edge shape. Uh, you can absolutely touch and customize every point of the drum size, uh, barren edge, hardware, and finish. Mm. Uh, and we have a specialist on staff because, you know, we call it uh, decision paralysis. <laughs> because sometimes yeah. when, you, when you really do, the sky is the limit. And you're getting ready to to drop a bunch of money. You want to make sure you're making the right choice. So we have a full time masterworks concierge, t- Mr. Tom Storch here, that is available. He talks with consumers, talks with dealers to help guide through the process. And it really starts with the drummer. Like number one, what how do, what are you looking for? How do you what's your end 
in game. What kind of gigs do you play? You know, what kind of sound do you want? And we help point them in the right direction, you know, to, to all that stuff, to the wood choice, you know, exotic yeah. veneers, you know, different paint, uh, bandage to make sure they're happy. And even to the point to where if they want a special color, we'll send them a swatch, you know, and sometimes it takes more than one swatch before the customer goes, that's it, make it match that. And then at the factory, we keep, we make an extra drum of every Masterworks kit we make. And we keep that file and formula and keep that drum, you know, in case somebody wants to add on or, you yeah. know, sometimes these kits are used in catalogs and somebody wants to order one. Hmm. Man, y you're exactly right where, it's just like everything in life. There's if there's too many options, it's it hurts you almost. Like if you're picking a paint color for your house or something like that. Like if you narrow it down to three and say pick one of these three, you're you're bound to choose a little bit better. So it's great you guys have someone there to help you. I mean, man, what a cool job he has helping and, people <laughs> yeah. go through that. And it's a truly a custom drum set. You know, a lot of companies they'll just go, well, you can change this and this. And then here's your color palettes to choose from, you know, hmm. but, but we, we let the customer choose the wood and shelf thickness and you can, you can decide on the ply layup. If you want maple and mahogany and you want mahogany on the inside, but then you want maple and you want X number of plies of, of this wood and that wood, and you want it to be this thick, you know, you can, every single drum can be made different within a drum set. The funny thing is, you know, our reference series in, in 2000 was born out of our Masterwork series. And I'll, I'll talk more about that when we, when we get into, you know, that sure. time period. But I think the most notable things in, in, the, in the 90s were the, you know, of course, Masters, uh, you know, our marching drums were really hitting the mark. We celebrated our 50th anniversary and uh, we introduced – the world's truly most customizable drum set. Do you have any like, um, like anything that comes to mind of like this one, you know, um, crazy millionaire guy, he made his drum set match his Ferrari and he did this, these wild combinations or any, are there any like, you know, kind of crazy custom shop ones that, that come to mind? There was, um, Ricky, the late Ricky Lawson had a friend of his that was a, a, a big wheel, uh, at Microsoft that he wanted a drum set to match his Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> so we got, we, we even got to paint from, you know, Ferrari paint, you know, oh, wow. and, and, and painted the drum set. But, uh, the, probably the most ambitious drum set as of late. Uh, is for uh, the cigar manufacturer, Mr. Nick Perdomo. Uh, <laughs> he's a good friend of all of ours here. He had a, he wanted, he's, you know, he makes the world's best cigars and, and his, some of his clientele are, 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 are very wealthy. But yeah. he wanted, he introduced this new cigar that had this label made out of gold foil and different, different metals of tin. And he was like, I I want to I want to put this on the drums. I want to put this on every one of my drums. And we were like, you know, first we got to make sure we can. There's not going to be any reaction between the paint and and you know, can we get it onto the shell and will it last? So it took about a year and a half to go through different tests, but we were able to do it. And that was okay. one of the most crazy ones uh, as of late that we built. And of course, some of the kits we built for Tommy Lee and. Uh, Joey Jordison at the time and uh, Dennis Chambers. I mean, Dennis has had some wonderful Masterworks kits. Yeah. These have to be, rightfully so, these have to be expensive. I mean, if you're getting it painted like your Ferrari or if you're getting it wrapped in, you know, cigar kind of foil that takes a year, these have got to be some pricey <laughs> drum yeah. sets. Yeah. Nick Perdomo's drum set was, yeah, there it's, it's like buying a, uh, High-end car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> oh my god. Okay. Um, but well, it doesn't that- always have to be like that. I mean, no. Yeah, I mean, you can get you can spend you know on the street five or six thousand dollars or or you know as yeah. or as as much as you want. It really just depends on how far you go. Which is the price of like a nice custom drum set. Like we all we all kind of know that. Um, yeah. Now, I remember playing, I think it was, I did the Guitar Center drum off when I was younger. I think the first one I did was in 2003, and um, that was my first experience playing Pearl drums was they would have, I believe, a um, Pearl Masters, I guess, Maple um, set, Silver Sparkle, and that was like the set that you would play in the Guitar Center drum off, and I was just like blown away at how good they sounded i was 13 so i was used to just having a i think i had a big old ludwig um 80s rocker 2 set at that point that did not sound as good because i didn't know how to tune it or anything so that was my first pearl experience that was just uh kind of mind-blowing how good they sounded yeah yeah the toms you know we're known for our, our tom sound they speak well they're just not all thuddy you know you can really get some resonance out of them that's a great Highlight in the '90s. So let's chug on into the uh, into the 2000s. There, what what happened then? Oh, 2000s. Well, on the marching side, we we introduced carbon ply uh, snare drums, but also on the drum set, carbon ply maple. So we started putting, you know, like the old fiberglass drums were made. We inter- we introduced where you could put a carbon ply inner ply, and it really made the drums extremely loud. Uh, but even more important than that, we introduced our award-winning reference series, which won numerous awards all over the world. And the premise of the reference series was born out of our masterworks program. We, we kept seeing a trend of what guys wanted, you know, certain guys, you know, if you think of the drum set of all the different tones and sounds you want, you don't want the same sound out of an eight and 10 inch Tom as you do your floor Tom. They're tuned different. You want what you expect to hear is completely different. So looking at trends and masterworks and thinking about even the most original drum sets back when they used Chinese toms with tacked heads and the guys had these, you know, wood blocks and everything. It's like, why are we under the mindset of where if a drum set all has to be made out of the same woods when what the sounds you want very differently from each size. Obviously, yeah. you're not going to tune to 10 the same way you tune a 16. So we, th- we thought, well, how can you accent what you want to hear? And that's where reference series came into play where, you know, basically the only drum that's made out of 100% of one kind of wood is a 12-inch tom. And everything smaller than a 12 uses birch inner plies, you know, uh, and then anything bigger than a 12 the drum shells get thicker, the barren edges get rounder, and African mahogany is added to the enterprise. So you to capitalize on that low end. So, you know, birch has more attack. It makes sense to have it on your smaller drums. And African mahogany it makes sense to have it on your larger drums to accentuate those desired tones. Yeah. Wow. You're totally right. Why I think with a lot of things with drums, we do things because of tradition, where we've done it before. You know, we Symbol stands are like this for however long. Yeah. Well, you know, I, why not change it? And we listen to artists, and we've always have listened to our artists and drummers to figure out what they want and how we can make it better. Another landmark product is our Demon Drive pedal, which is our P3000 yes. series, Direct Drive. And, I mean, that pedal has all – you can – change the it's got two cam positions it's got a it's a convertible footboard from long board to traditional style you know once again in in pearl fashion we want to give the drummer options so that they can dial in the product to meet their individual needs so it becomes their voice Hmm. gosh that's so cool and i mean the quality continues obviously and pearl is very consistently been one of the top players in the game obviously that's still true today um not jumping ahead but uh it's casey cooper on youtube has got to be one of the most um almost like kiss you know where you look at the back of the album and you see it 
so many people, I'm sure so many kids watch Casey Cooper and his YouTube channel and see his Pearl drums. And that has to be a great, he has to be one of the, you know, biggest ambassadors to the brand right now. He's a great ambassador. What a wonderful guy. He's first class, top notch gentleman, uh, really believes in the product. You know, yeah. he, 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 really plays it because he believes in it and he loves it. He is a Pearl fanatic at heart. Yeah. Mm. Cool. So um, I just jumped ahead there. I mean, he's been doing it for a long time, but yeah, it sounds like you guys, uh, the 2000s has been good to you. Is there anything in the works right now that, uh, you know, Pearl fans can be excited for? Well, you know, I can't. There, we of course we've always got things cooking. I mean, we we plan out years ahead. Sometimes it takes, uh, you know, several years for a product to come to fruition. Um, but yeah, to, uh, the only thing I can say is uh, next year we're going to have s- some cool new products. Nice. As we wrap up here, I think uh, I usually say, "Why don't you tell people where they can find you?" Everyone can find Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> pretty quickly so obviously there's uh is there anywhere that they should go directly i'm assuming pearldrums.com yeah actually it's pearldrum.com okay. okay if you if you go to our website you can see links to uh there's a page on there that's got a complete list of pearl dealers authorized dealers for the usa so you can search by state and by dealer's name and uh yeah i mean we're accessible you can find us anywhere Gotcha. Yeah. Pearldrum.com. People can visit that and check it out. Um, they, uh, they're awesome drums and let me give a quick shout out here. So this is just kind of funny. So, um, uh, Ted Richardson who sent me a message requesting, he's like, you got to do a Pearl episode, um, on March 5th, 2019. And it is now August 26th, 2020. So I, I always kind of say this on the show, but sometimes these episodes really do take a very long time to um, to get going because I mean, you and I have been kind of going back and forth on email for for a long time now, and things would happen, and you were on jury duty I think for a bit. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's but it's it's finally here, and uh, I'm just really excited. If you're listening to this, it's already out in the world. But Pearl has a huge following, and I, I'm I'm very glad I can finally get an episode out um, to. Because I don't, I do this, I interview people all the time about drums and I'm looking at drum history stuff constantly and I didn't know 90% of what you said about the history of the company, starting with music stands, post-World War II, I didn't know any of that. So I, I think people are going to love it. Good, good. Well, well, Bart, thanks for connecting and uh, happy to do it. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we love drums, we love music and we want to make the best products, musical instruments we possibly can. Perfect. Well, you're doing it. Awesome. Thank you, Raymond. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Bart. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.